trying to promote buy local. You will see that rotating around. You're going to see rack cards that are supporting all of our um, our local uh, events and um, uh, spread the word. We want people to come into Carroll County and buy, okay, and use our services. Jim Thomas, come on up, okay. This, uh, you know, you never, I always say you're never too old to learn and um, uh, Jim has been a, um, a wonderful friend here in the community. A lot of people use him and outside the community. Um, and so he's going to give us, gives us some tools for our toolbox, as I call it. And he's going to talk a little bit about himself and how we can kind of change our ways. Okay, go. I got oh, my mic got here. So. Okay. Also, can you uh, Get take, you. take me a couple pictures during this? Yes. And figure it out. <laughs> figure it out. Okay. <laughs> So, Brooke, I wanted to thank you, too, because whenever I go to uh, <coughs> Gunner's, I can just arrive and say, Jim special, <laughs> and she cooks me up something. So I just really appreciate that kind of community um, and really having a place like that, because uh, it really makes a difference, I think, when and Brooke's so great about taking care of people that come. So it's really fantastic. So the other thing that really was exciting for me today I wanted to show you this new piece of hardware, which is part of the new Microsoft Office Suite program. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if, I think if you buy before next weekend, you get your choice of colors. I only got red and black, but uh, I was excited that I could actually have a retro experience with the board. But I requested it because I didn't have time for a PowerPoint. So, um, I'm going to talk about stress today. and. I know that's kind of been a, a, uh, a topic which sometimes we close our ears to and open our ears to because it's sort of this buzzword in terms of um, you know, whether a business perspective or personally. I think sometimes after a while, you know, we tend to think, oh, I know all about that or, you know, can't change things, whatever it might be. So what I want to try and do today is through the lens of Chinese medicine and not just Chinese medicine, but looking at sort of systems of traditional healing, which, which are basically any kind of form of medicine in terms of the pre-industrial revolution in this country in terms of a paradigm or a context for healing. Because often what happens in our lives, and it, you know, it's true on so many levels, that you know, we get, there are certain assumptions about things, our health, our bodies, that we don't really question because we think about taking care of ourselves almost in habitual kinds of ways. So if we have a pain or we're not feeling well, that there's a certain prompting or cue within ourselves that we're used to kind of pursuing certain avenues of self-care. So what I want to try and talk about today is more of a context for healing and health in relation to stress, because I think when I was here last time, David Roush was here and there was an introduction about I was going to talk. and. He said, well, you know, it's all stress or, you know, stress is a favorable thing. And basically in our lives, all those kind of inputs in our environment, it's what we have to work with. So I don't want to limit stress to just that sense of the acute phase of things in our lives, although that's obviously important when events happen, how we respond to them. But what makes more of a difference, and most of us, again, it's very, very subtle, are the kinds of things that shape us over long periods of time. And the example I want to give you about that, if those of you have been to the Caribbean and you have a thing called the trade winds, right? Let's say they're blowing in this direction. I think I just lost the mic. We good? Okay. So what you'll notice if those winds blow, let's say, steadily from the southeast, 25 miles an hour the whole time, right? And if you look at the trees on the shoreline, what happens to them often in relation to this sort of the winds have changed, let's say, you'll see the structure of a tree really bent in a way to brace themselves against that wind. But it's almost like that particular wind holds them up. And this is something that happens steadily and over a long period of time. Well, this is sort of the nature of the environmental part of our lives in terms of questions of lifestyle and how these sort of winds in our lives will shape us over a period of time. Now, obviously, the other huge factor in that dynamic is not just the wind, but the nature of the tree itself. You can imagine a tree that has a very shallow root structure, 
maybe a tree that has a very low water content, the first wind comes along and a branch is going to snap off, right? Or a tree with a very shallow root structure and it rains a lot and this wind comes along and what happens and the tree goes down. So what's most important in this question of looking at lifestyle and the person in the form of medicine I practice, but again, I think in our lives, it's a place of empowerment versus a place of victimization around our health is it's a human being in this situation that has things happen to them. And so we're going to explore for a little bit the nature of what our power is in response to change and maybe some assumptions that we all live under just based on you know, our, our medical systems or our in, in, uh, institutional systems, the way we've been raised are all factors that shape even our response to pain. It's very interesting the way maybe you know people that say, I have a really high tolerance for pain. So they, you know, they might not go to the physician for months and months and months where another person will have a very subtle change in their body and they'll respond to get help in some way. So you can even see from the experience of pain or a symptom within ourselves, Lots and lots of different experiences around that, okay? Is there an eraser here? Besides my elbow? This color actually might work. I need a little black in the shirt. Oh, okay. I had to pay extra for the eraser, I think, in my hardware package, so I didn't get it. So this question of the human being in the face of change has been one that's asked as a sort of a life or a philosophical question for centuries or millennia perhaps of so this relationship between the person and the environment. And within sort of scientific circles, you'll see that question of you know, nature versus nurture. And um, what's happened over the past, what, two decades maybe like with the Human Genome Project, for instance, is really a skewing of that question towards this idea of one's nature really dictating the outcome for this relationship. So it's kind of a curious thing. So from a scientific perspective, what's called a reductionist theory looks at how if you divide life up into smaller and smaller pieces that you're going to learn some fundamental truth about the whole. So in, in response to human behavior even and human health, what's sort of the, the forerunner of this question has been about the destiny of our own genes and heredity in this factor. And that's kind of getting to be a very strong conversation. That's also a very curious thing when that begins to happen. <clears throat> so I'm going to write this and then step out of the way. Forgive my left-handedness, that's me, really me taking my time writing. So maybe you can answer this. If over time, if we're told that our health, our behavior is dictated by a, a, a heredity path through us, what does that do to us in terms of a response to change? Anybody? If that's what we're really told that really shapes us. I guess we take it for granted. Take it for granted, but let's say, in the, let's say in our response to change. We have no responsibility. We have no responsibility. And what about just in terms of our power in the face of change? Nothing we can, do. Nothing we can really do. So here again is a, an inherent assumption that's arising within conventional medical thinking, right? But over time, there's an erosion in terms of our responsibility two situations because we can sort of say, well, I guess I'll throw in my towel because Aunt Louise was like this or Uncle Joe had this. So it's really curious. And, and what does that do to us over time? Again, do we question that anymore about that whole sort of dynamic about the human being in our response to situations? And that's one of the assumptions in, let's say, a medical paradigm would be, and that's growing stronger and stronger. So let's say you go to a healthcare practitioner and you, you know, your, your elbow hurts and you're told, well, you have arthritis. So from this particular model, that arthritis might come from Uncle Joe and Aunt Betsy, et cetera. So again, in response to that change of movement, perhaps you notice her pain, what do you say? Oh, well. 
And the second piece of that would be, what is the belief in the culture about when you face change, what is the, the power agent in the relationship? Anybody. So when you face a change, let's say a symptom, where are you told the power lies to face the change? In what? What? Medication. What, medication, perhaps. Right. Surgery, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So again, in terms of the structure of this empowerment, we're going to say that the power structure assumption within this comes from the outside. Fair to say? So as Audrey, is it, was saying about responsibility, there's two tiers here again. So we're facing change. And what are we told here again? We face change. What are we supposed to bring into our tool bag to face change in terms of our own responsibility and empowerment? Where does it come from? Outside. So you can see there are two inherent assumptions. One is from a genetic model that we're totally powerless. And secondly, in facing change, that we're not primarily to rely on ourselves, but to, we're to rely on an external agent that perhaps awakens some power within us to deal with that situation. And fair enough to say that's just a particular paradigm. Now, what's, what's difficult is we don't acknowledge that as a paradigm or assumption. We live that often as a truth. And you can see over time that you know, life is about facing change, and that if, if these inherent assumptions in facing change are continually undermining our sense of power in relation to those change, changes, it's not a really good picture in terms of long term from a health standpoint, cultural, however you want to look at that, in terms of kind of an erosion of our own sense of empowerment in relation to these things. So what I want to do now is present kind of another model of this. Now the other thought I'm having is um, if you look at this idea of empowerment and you look at a current situation, for instance, with let's say young folks experimenting with drugs, how in the world can you expect a teenager to change their strategy for dealing change when the whole culture deals with change in the same way? Now, those drugs are different. I'm not in support of those. Obviously, they're illegal, they're harmful. But in terms of a empowerment perspective, how can we ask our kids to respond any differently? And yet we have all these campaigns about say no to drugs, say no to drugs, but there's nothing that goes hand in hand with that as a consistent message that talks about, again, our relationship to change and issues of personal empowerment. So I really struggle with that when I see, you know, tons of money spent over how many decades of the war on drugs, for instance, and I think some statistics would say not very successfully often, you know? Um, and yet how do you address these fun, uh, underlying fundamental assumptions and dynamics of what it is to be human as we face these kinds of things? The other connection which is interesting around that, and a little bit of a segue, but if you look at um, what's happened with, uh, where, how pharmaceuticals are marketed, where's a common sign that you see every day that you probably don't question on the side of a grocery store? What's it say? Grocery store. About pharmaceuticals. What's, what's it always on the same sign? Food and drugs. Now see here again something where you don't, you see it every day, but over time, what's the message about that? I mean, food is a drug in a good way and a bad way in terms of it's very, very powerful in terms of changing your life and it's a source of energy. But here at the same time, we start linking these things together as a culture on an institutional level and we don't even really challenge these underlying sort of building blocks of how we operate. So I'm gonna, if, so if you look at our culture that we emphasize the power that is in material things, okay? So if, if we, if I ask you what's real, for example, we'll say it's what you can touch and what you can taste and what you can feel. Our medicine is very much oriented towards a biochemical model of human beings, right? So therefore, by, if we go to the physician, we look at our blood work, you know, our hematocrits are this and that and the other, so that our orientation for saying we're okay very much comes from a, a material basis. Fair to say? So how many of you have gone to the physician 
with perfect blood work, good blood pressure, and you feel like hell. <laughs> or, not necessarily terribly, but you know in your heart of hearts that there's something off that will not show up yet in terms of the material plane, or at least the parameters from which those things are judged from the place where you receive 99% of your support. Okay? So, as what the strength of traditional systems of medication, of, of healing, is looking at the nature of the invisible in our lives and trying to come up with systems of both treatment but also support that really empower people in that invisible spot before there's a materialistic shift in our biochemistry. And you can look at this from a time-based perspective, okay? So here are li here's our life with birth, um, birth event, different things that happened to us. So I'm going to pick a time here where related to one's um, digestion, let's say that we have blood in our stool, okay? And that happens way here. Let's say we're 46 years old. And so for this particular person, they only respond to their bodies in an acute situation. They see blood, it's like, oh my God, go to the physician, right? But what's happened at these other markers here? Maybe this was the first chili con carne, right? 10 years ago, heartburn, you know? Or the chili cook-off contest, you know? And inflammation, whatever. And then here was the first, like, Prilosec, right? or Nexium. I'll just put Pry there. So, and back here as a kid, there were always like these sort of subtle digestive kind of things, you know? Maybe this was a kid who threw up when they were nervous or the first day of school, always a stomach upset. So what do you see here in this hierarchy from a time perspective is this invisible and visible, right? So there are things in our lives that are occurring in this domain, right, in the unseen, but very registered within our feeling sensation. And then finally, over a period of time, there's a manifestation of the symptom, which is then recognized, and then obviously there would be blood in the stool sample. Maybe at this period of time when someone gets, uh, um, takes in acids or Prilosec, there may or may not be any signs of, even at that point, of any pathology. But yet you can see there is a relationship between here and here. Okay? So, so where do we choose to intervene? What's the relationship? This, there are some questions about this, right? So what's the relationship between our emotions and our body? What's, what, what's the relationship between the way we think and our body? So with this kind of thing, we, we, in this example, you could say, well, here's a kind of nervous kid, right? And we know maybe from your own personal experience that, that in our culture we say about butterflies even in our stomach. So we know there's a relationship emotionally between the way our body responds. And yet medically, it's often hard to find a place where those, connect, those dots are connected for us or there's an encouragement really to respond more at this end of the spectrum rather than waiting until things happen over here. And you know, there are tons of examples of this. How many people are admitted to the emergency room each year with chest pain and ha don't have a heart attack? Probably more people than have heart attacks. And the, the, the examples go on and on and on where in this invisible dimension, all sorts of things are cooking. But again, there's really not a, an easy way to often address those things. Now, this is all about stress, basically. But I'm not talking about acute stress of you know, losing your job, <coughs> you know, tomorrow and all this kind of thing. They're important, but over time, it's this wind that blows through our lives at a very, very subtle level that is going to be the long-term effects that eventually will materialize on a physical level in some way, okay? And I think most of you experience this. This is not new news. It's how we live our lives. But it's just unfortunate that within our institutional practices, that there's just not a lot of support to be able to look at our lives as, from this perspective and to intervene in ways so that we regain some sense of power.
kind of glad I didn't get the regular eraser. This is really quite effective. So what I want to look at next are the sources of our power and our energy in our lives. Now, what I've been presenting to you is kind of in the big picture known as energetic medicine or an energetic picture of one's life. Now, in our culture, that's considered really strange because, again, the paradigm from our culture is so materially oriented. If we start talking about a personal energy system, we'll relate to that maybe about our vitality, but we don't really look at the reality of that or we don't look at our bodies as like a bioelectric system. If I was Chinese or I was Indian, this conversation would be very normal to say, what's the nature of one's chi or one's prana in India, that there's a term for that that's been around for centuries. In our culture, if I start talking like that, you're looked at kind of sideways, again, because it's just not part of the cult cultural paradigm. But most of us, again, have experienced something about that in ourselves where we have a vital energy or you know, in a very simple way, when you go to the funeral home and you look at somebody in the casket, it's what's missing. And that human beings, again, are this balance of a physical form and then what activates that physical form. So you could say being human is a balance between the substance of, our, of ourselves and yet we're activated by something, okay? And that activation, interesting question, like well, where does that come from? And, what if it's low in one person, or what if it's not in balance in one person? So these traditional systems of, of medicine want to look at this relationship between, again, the human being and the substance of nature and the flow of this vital, in Chinese it's called qi, in Japanese it's called ki, in East Indian medicine it's called prana. And all systems of indigenous healing have some understanding of the energetic basis of being human. And I think it's kind of starting to enter in our culture, but certainly medicine now is not quite so supported because of this almost commitment to the material sort of supremacy and the biochemical paradigm of, um, of our lives, okay? So we're gonna look at the sources of this energy system, okay? So we have our constitution is the first thing, and I talked earlier about this balance between nature and nurture, so obviously how we come into the world, if this is our birth as an event here, that we come into the world with a certain propensity. You can look at it like your Sears diehard battery, you know, and maybe you know people that come into the world, I'm gonna show you in a minute one of the analogies you can think about, like what's the nature of your river? Are you, you come in the world with a Colorado River, this incredible abundance, the Colorado River person is the one that can you know, miss nights of sleep, doesn't affect them, can eat anything they want. It's the person in the news that you read is 110 years old that smoked a pack of cigarettes and drank a quart of whiskey and is still thriving. And ironically, what do we say in our culture? Well, I guess cigarettes and, and uh, alcohol aren't so bad for you then. No. It's this person was born with the Nile River. And so when they assimilate their lives, they can eat us under the table. They can, you know, again, work long hours. And because that battery is so strong that what they do really doesn't make a whole lot of difference in some way. But most of us aren't like that. But certainly that's a factor of what we're born with. And then once, when we're in utero here from a prenatal perspective, where is our source of energy at that point? So we have this one cell that is born into existence at the moment of conception. And the motor that runs cell division at that point basically is the, the heredity energy that unfolds in a, per, in a particular way based on human development. It's not to think about, you know, becoming three months old or, you know, it's something that's taken care of automatically, right? There's a, there's a motor at work that unfolds very, very naturally. But in utero, where does all our energy come from? The mother, right? So both from a, uh, uh, how, how we're nourished at that period of time comes through a bloodline. And so in terms of what happens after we're born is very different in terms of we ha how we have to learn to acquire energy from the environment. So from a holistic perspective or from this broader based of nature versus nurture, 
the constitutional factors, prenatal factors, all will influence then the child that is born into the world, even you know, before you take your first breath. They're very, very important factors. So what happens if you have a weaker constitution? If you're born perhaps with a spinal deformity or you're born with uh, a hole in your heart or you know, maybe you know people that are born where their constitutional energy is compromised in some way. So from their birth then, someone that, that this energy is compromised, even a premature birth for instance, because what do we know about that? that your lungs will be compromised because they are the last system to come into their strength before one is born. So often if you're born prematurely, that right away you know you will have an inherited lung constitutional weakness, which will then shape this whole place. Until your last breath, your lungs will probably be kind of a vulnerable, a vulnerable place, okay? So after you are born, what are the sources of energy that you then have to learn or naturally acquire? Anybody? What are the sources of our, let's say, physiological and spiritual energy, everything, emotional energy? Breath? What else? Food. Food? Yeah? Environment. 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 And that's this <laughs> weird question again because there, there are two factors we'll talk about in terms of the person relation, but yes, lifestyle forces, sleep, okay? Now the last one again is this kind of woo-woo thing. I'm going to call it the universal energy field because this is a place that, again, different cultures have acknowledged for a long time that we are actually swimming in this sea of energy that's around us and that we are exchanging with constantly. So our relationship to this field is also an important health factor. Now we might know it again because someone radiates a kind of vitality. Where does that come from? Someone's color, someone's strength in their voice. All these factors again which you could not you know, necessarily quantify in terms of their blood work and stuff, we can all look at people and make that kind of assessment about a level of vitality. Now again, the universal energy field, I understand it might you know, raise a lot of questions with people. And yet I would encourage you to look at our, you know, now the world's such a small place, look at other cultures from a Chinese standpoint, and India particularly, where there have been long-standing practices of understanding how to cultivate this internal chi. Have you all heard of Tai Chi, Qi Gong? different forms of yoga, prayer, and meditation are all about not physical movement. That's what we see in our culture, like karate. We have a very uh, orientation. Western karate is all about self-defense and how many people you can take out, right? And all about sort of building this macho image. But the heart of these kind of practices is very, very internal. And it's all about being in touch with the flow of your internal energy. And all these forms, anybody seen Tai Chi being done? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So it's these very slow forms. It looks like, how could that be exercise? You're not winded. But the idea is that these forms are to teach you a way, almost a meditative way, to be in touch with this internal energy dynamic. So with practice over time, you can be in touch with this flow within you and begin to recognize that timeline I showed you. So what if your energy is off in some way? You go to the physician, your blood works fine, but you know your energy is off. So what if there's a way to tune into this over time where you can begin to make adjustments and fine tune your life based on this much more subtle appreciation and awareness for these inner dynamics, okay? so. I put on your sheet there that I handed out. I'm not going to write these down. So we have sleep, um, food, universal energy field, um, the environment, one person meant, which is right, which is lifestyle, and also, also our attitudes and our beliefs, which again will shape how we use this energy that we have. Okay? So those are, this is going to be the balance of things that are available to us in terms of our response to change. And so the question is, how do we learn to maximize the energy that we would extract from our food in terms of our diets? How do we learn to maximize 
the energy that we get from the breath? How do we learn to adjust our attitudes and our emotions that will basically support this inner energy so that we flourish? And how do we you know, deal the best we can with our environment? It's difficult. I mean, if you have, let's say that you're a keyboard operator, right? You're going to be in a certain posture all the time. It's just like that tree I showed you. Very difficult if you do data entry eight hours a day, support your wrist. But that's going to be a major influence in terms of, over time, your energy system, correct? Um, you know, if, if you're physical labor, you're shoveling, if you're moving concrete, all sorts of examples where the physical environment will be a huge factor in terms of looking at what's going to be shaping your life experience the most. Okay? So what I would encourage you all to do is just a very simple inventory of looking at these factors of what supports you and what takes energy away. It's very, very simple. It's like doing, you know, what's your diet look like in terms of vitality of food? Um, you know, in terms of the breath, you have a breath practice. Sounds sort of silly, but, you know, if, if your oxygen is diminished over time, you know how your, your vitality is going to diminish. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, one's attitudes and beliefs and how they shape your life, it's sometimes hard to challenge those things, but it's really trying to look at, you know, patterns within your, uh, your life to see you know, where you're losing the most energy and where you gain the most energy. Things within your lifestyle you notice are most draining in terms of your posture, in terms of things I've talked about in terms of being at the computer too long, things like that. So at any moment in time when someone comes before me, right, or before you, doesn't matter, business relationship, in this moment in time, all of these things are shaping me. My, 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 my heritage, my, the way I eat, the way I think about things are all present in me at this moment in time, right? So we're not just talking about a static look at my health. We look at my blood and we say, okay, the hematocrit's low. But what, what shapes this is all these particular forces, right, moving through me. Just like the tree, those forces shape that tree in a particular way. So what you can evaluate for yourself is, is how these forces are going to interplay through you and then where these forces might be conflictual. And where these forces are conflictual, what I guarantee you is a symptom line. Just the way with like plate tectonics, underground earthquakes, right? These two two uh, land masses are moving beside each other, correct? Different direction. All this energy and tension builds up. And what do we call that where they meet is a fault because their force is moving in oppositional direction. Eventually that force releases and what do we have? Tremendous energy release along those fault lines. We are exactly the same way. That what will happen, I'll give you an example. Let's say you're in a job that you hate and you have a mortgage. You have a family to support. So already what happens, right? Spiritually or emotionally, you have a force coming in that, that says, you don't like your job, you don't want to be here. But you have a mortgage payment. What happens along those lines? Think of a million, think of a million examples where there are conflictual forces at work. Tons. Let's say a person comes to me and measures their coffee intake in pots of coffee, not in cups of coffee. Okay? What I try and listen for is where are these forces the most sort of troublesome? So in that case, from the food standpoint, I'm going to look at that. I probably can't do much with that person as long as they're being skewed and directed by such a strong force from the food standpoint. Okay. So I'm not going to go into lots of, but you can see. So you can evaluate your own life in that kind of way. What I would encourage you to do sort of in closing is to take a timeline of your life, look at the arisal of symptoms on one top of the timeline, and then look at life events on the bottom. And usually you will see for major life events, you will see a symptom occurring after or fairly near 
a major kind of change. Okay? Now, the blessing, the curse of this is being human kind of means that. Yes, we respond, we change. But what if you change the context of your experience as a human being and be begin to look at these conflictual lines and the symptom, right, that emerges along that line then is a teacher, correct? Because it's going to emerge out of this conflictual place. So you can begin to work with yourself and work with symptoms with pain as a guide, as a teacher, to look back in your life and to begin to say, wow, what is this, what is this here to show me? How is this symptom representing a way I might have walked out of balance in my life? And how can I use the symptom as a teacher to restore balance? Okay? Now, most of the time in this current context when we spoke earlier, the symptom is something just to be fixed or swept under the rug, or it's a sign of the machine being broken. And maybe we want to, like, run away from it. You know, I just give the example of my cousin's dog. I'd be at the house and something's in the woods making a noise, and most of us want to run away and put the sheet over the covers. This dog runs right into their fear, you know? So it's the same thing with the symptom. What if we learn to actually move towards the symptom and move into the symptom as a teacher. So right away when we started talking that it's a, rest it's a restoration of one's power in relation to one's life outside of just a medical paradigm for your own life. Okay? So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Now this is not an easy thing. Some symptoms you might never know. Emotions are very, very subtle. Some might be very, very obvious, but I would just encourage you to look at this timeline, do a little bit of assessment, and then you know, bring this power back into your life in relation to using your body as a teacher. Okay? So thank you very much. If you have questions, I'm here for a few minutes. Um, our website has lots of things on there in terms of PDF files about health and stuff. So uh, enjoyed this morning. Thank you.